Hello class, we will now have the first of two parts of our lecture on the endocrine system. Signaling by secreted molecules can be classified into three types based on the distance over which the signal acts. So it can be autocrine, paracrine, or endocrine. In autocrine, the secreted molecule targets itself. In paracrine, the secretor molecule would target a nearby or a neighboring cell, while in endocrine, the secreted molecules, also known as hormones, act on target cells that are distant from their site of synthesis. Endocrine diseases can be generally classified as diseases of underproduction or overproduction of hormones and their resulting biochemical and clinical consequences. Or it can be diseases associated with the development of mass lesions and such lesions might be non-functional or they might be associated with overproduction or underproduction of hormones. The endocrine system consists of highly integrated and widely distributed groups of organs called glands. So now we start with the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is a small bean-shaped structure that lies at the base of the brain within the cella turcica and it is attached to the hypothalamus by the pituitary stalk. It measures about one centimeter in greatest diameter. The function of the pituitary gland is controlled by the hypothalamus. Along with the hypothalamus, the pituitary has a central role in regulating the function of most of the other endocrine glands. The pituitary gland is composed of two morphologically and functionally distinct components which are the anterior lobe or the adenohypophysis and the posterior lobe, which is the neurohypophysis. The anterior pituitary or the adenohypophysis, which constitute about 80% of the gland, produces tropic hormones that stimulate the production of hormones from the thyroid, adrenal, and other glands. The anterior pituitary is composed of epithelial cells derived embryologically from the developing oral cavity. Now, on routine histologic sections, the pituitary contains acidophils that have eosinophilic, eosinophilic cytoplasm, basophils have basophilic cytoplasm, and the chromophobe cells with poorly staining cytoplasm. There are six terminally differentiated cell types in the anterior pituitary, each of which is defined by the hormones that it will synthesize. Somatotropes are the most abundant cells in the anterior pituitary produce growth hormones. Mamosomatotropes produce both growth hormones and prolactin, and your lactotropes produce prolactin, which is essential for lactation. Now, these somatotropes, mamosomatotropes, and lactotropes are acidophils. Corticotropes, tyrotropes, and gonadotropes are basophils. Corticotropes produce adrenocorticotropic hormones or the ACTH. It also produces proopiomelanocortin or the POMC and the melanocyte stimulating hormone. While thyrotropes produce the thyroid stimulating hormone. Gonadotropes produce uh, the follicle stimulating hormone or FSH and the luteinizing hormone, the LH. In women, the FSH stimulates the formation of graphene follicles in the ovary and the LH induces ovulation and the formation of corpora lutea in the ovary. 
The FSH and LH both regulate spermatogenesis and testosterone production in males. The posterior pituitary or the neurohypophysis consists of modified glial cells termed pituicides and axonal processes extending from nerve cell bodies. The posterior pituitary secretes two peptide hormones, the antidiuretic hormone or also known as the ADH or the arginine vasopressin and the second peptide hormone is the oxytocin. These hormones are actually synthesized in the hypothalamus and are transported to the posterior pituitary. Therefore, the pituitary is not really a gland as it, as, uh, it does not produce any hormone. The preformed hormones are released from the posterior pituitary in response to appropriate stimuli and are released directly to the circulation. For example, the most function of ADH is to conserve water by restricting diuresis during periods of dehydration and hypovolemia. Now, ADH also increased reabsorption of water in the collecting tubules, thereby conserving water, producing a more concentrated urine. And if there is decreased blood pressure or increased plasma osmotic pressure, this will also trigger the antidiuretic hormone secretion. Dilation of the cervix in pregnancy results in release of oxytocin, leading to the contraction of uterine smooth muscles during labor and also during the postnatal period. The oxytocin acts on the smooth muscles surrounding the lactiferous ducts of the mammary gland and could facilitate lactation. Diseases of the pituitary gland can be divided into those that primarily affect the anterior lobe and those that predominantly affect the posterior lobe. Diseases of anterior pituitary may come into clinical attention because of either excess or deficiency of pituitary hormones or to mass effects. Hyperpituitarism arises from excess or increased secretion of tropic hormones and the causes of hyperpituitarism include pituitary hyperplasia, adenomas, and carcinomas. Or it may be due to secretion of hormones by non-pituitary tumors and certain hypothalamic disorders. Hypopituitarism results from deficiency of tropic hormones. It may be caused by ischemic injury, surgery or radiation, inflammatory disorders, and the mass effects of non-functional pituitary adenomas. Now, because of the close proximity of the optic nerve and chiasm to the cella, Expanding pituitary lesions often compress the optic chiasm, and this gives rise to visual field abnormalities, classically in the form of defects in both lateral or temporal visual fields, the so-called bitemporal hemianopsia. Diseases of the posterior pituitary often come to clinical attention because of increased or decreased secretion of antidiuretic hormone and associated changes in fluid and electrolyte balance. Now we talk about pituitary adenoma and hyperpituitarism. The most common cause of hyperpituitarism is an adenoma arising in the anterior lobe. Less common causes of hyperpituitarism are hyperplasia and carcinoma of the anterior pituitary gland. Pituitary adenomas can either be functional or non-functional or silent. Functional adenomas are associated with hormone excess and clinical manifestations thereof. 
while the non-functional or silent adenomas are without clinical symptoms of hormone excess and the excess hormone production is only at the tissue level and are determined by the immunohistochemical or ultrastructural methods only. Pituitary adenomas are classified on the basis of the hormones that are expressed by the tumor cells as seen in this table. Take note that some pituitary adenomas secrete two hormones and the most common combination is growth hormone and prolactin. Pituitary adenomas are usually found in adults the peak incidence is from 35 to 60 years of age. Pituitary adenomas are designated as microadenomas if they are less than 1 cm in diameter and macroadenomas if they exceed 1 cm in diameter. Non-functional adenomas and hormone-negative adenomas are likely to come to clinical attention at a later stage than those associated with endocrine abnormalities and are therefore more likely to be macroadenomas. Based on autopsy findings or studies, pituitary adenomas are discovered incidentally in up to 14% of cases and majority of these lesions are clinically silent microadenoma. The typical pituitary adenoma is soft and well circumscribed. A small adenoma may be confined to the cella torsica, but with expansion, they frequently erode the cella torsica and the anterior clinoid processes. In as many as 30% of cases, the adenomas are not encapsulated and infiltrate neighboring tissues such as the cavernous and sphenoid sinuses, the dura, and on occasions, the brain itself. Such lesions are termed aggressive adenomas. Note that macroadenomas tend to be invasive more frequently than the smaller tumors. On occasions, Acute hemorrhage into an adenoma is associated with clinical evidence of a rapidly enlarging mass, and that is called pituitary apoplexy. Here is a picture showing a typical pituitary adenoma, a soft, well-circumscribed lesion that is confined to the cella torsica as pointed by the arrow. This is a fixed specimen showing a huge pituitary adenoma and so this is a macroadenoma which is more than 1 cm in diameter. Now histologically, the typical pituitary adenomas are composed of uniform monomorphic polygonal cells arranged in sheets or cords. The supporting connective tissue or the reticulin is sparse, accounting for the soft gelatinous consistency of many of these tumors. Note that this cellular monomorphism and the absence of significant reticulin network distinguish pituitary adenomas from the normal anterior pituitary parenchyma. Also, histologic appearance cannot reliably predict biologic behavior of the tumor. So mitotic activity and expression of the KI67 or the MIB1 are typically low in pituitary adenomas, while higher than normal rates of cell division or high mitotic activity and nuclear expression of P53 are associated with more aggressive tumors. 
Okay, the signs and symptoms of pituitary adenoma are related to endocrine abnormalities and mass effects. Mass effects include radiographic abnormalities in the cella torsica, or there can be visual field abnormalities as expanding pituitary lesions compress the nerve fibers in the optic chiasm, as mentioned earlier. And this would result to problems in the lateral or temporal visual fields or the bilateral hemianopsia. The mass can also result to symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure like headache, nausea, and vomiting. Occasionally, the mass can cause hypopituitarism. Now, endocrine abnormalities would depend on the type of hormone secreted by the pituitary adenoma. The most frequent type of hyperfunctioning pituitary adenoma is prolactin secreting lactotrope adenoma or the prolactinoma, accounting for 30% of clinically recognized cases. These lesions range from small microadenomas to large expansile tumors associated with symptomatic mass effects. Lactotrope adenomas often undergo dystrophic calcification ranging from isolated samoma bodies to extensive calcification or what we call the pituitary stone. Prolactin secretion by functioning adenomas is usually efficient and proportional. Microadenomas can secrete sufficient amount of prolactin to cause hyperprolactinemia and serum prolactin concentration tend to correlate with the size of the adenoma. Increased serum levels of prolactin or prolactinemia cause amenorrhea, galactorrhea, loss of libido, and infertility. Prolactinoma is more readily diagnosed in women, especially between 20 to 40 years, because prolactinemia would disrupt the menstrual cycle. While in men and older women, the hormonal manifestations may be subtle that the tumor may reach to a considerable size, which is a macroadenoma, before it can be detected clinically. You have to remember that there are other causes of hyperprolactinemia other than adenomas. Serum prolactin level increases throughout pregnancy and would reach a peak at delivery. Nipple stimulation during suckling in lactating women would also increase prolactin level as well as response to many types of stress may induce uh, prolactinemia. Pathologic hyperprolactinemia may result from lactotrope hyperplasia where there is interference or loss of dopamine-mediated inhibition of prolactin secretion. This interference may occur when there is damage to the dopaminergic neurons of the hypothalamus or pituitary stalk, like secondary to head trauma, disturbing the inhibitory influence of the hypothalamus on the prolactin secretion. Exposure to drugs that block dopamine receptors on lactotrope cells can also cause hyperprolactinemia. Other causes of hyperprolactinemia include renal failure and hypothyroidism. The lactotrope adenomas are treated by surgery or more commonly with bromocryptin, which is a dopamine receptor agonist that causes the lesion to diminish in size. Next would be growth hormone secreting somatotrope adenoma. These are the second most common type of functioning pituitary adenoma and cause gigantism in children and acromegaly in adults. Manifestations of excessive growth hormones may be subtle. 
and that would explain why these adenomas may already be quite large by the time they come to clinical attention. Remember earlier, we have mentioned that some pituitary adenomas secrete two hormones, and the most common combination is growth hormone and prolactin. And these are the bihormonal mammosomatotrope adenomas. These adenomas synthesize both growth hormone and prolactin in the same cells. In contrast to the somatotrope lactotrope adenomas, which have growth hormone and prolactin expression in different cells. In contrast to corticotrope or gonadotrope adenomas, silent somatotrope adenomas are rare. Persistent elevation of growth hormone stimulates secretion of insulin-like growth factors by the liver, causing many of the clinical manifestations. Now, if a, if a somatotrope adenoma appears in children before the epiphysis have closed, the elevated levels of growth hormones and the insulin-like growth factor 1 result in gigantism, and gigantism or gigantism is characterized by a gener generalized increase in body size with disproportionately long arms and legs. If the growth hormones are increased after closure of the epiphysis, acromegaly develops. In acromegaly, bone density may increase or there is hyperostosis in both the spine and the hip. Uh, there would also be enlargement of the jaw which results in its protrusion or there is prognathism and there is broadening of the lower face. The feet and the hands are enlarged and the fingers become thickened and sausage-like. Here we have pictures showing gigantism. There is generalized increase in body size and disproportionately long arms and legs. The other picture shows acromegaly. And what is obvious in this picture is the enlargement of the jaw and uh, broadening of the lower face. We can also see the fingers are sausage-like. Now, growth hormone excess can also be associated with a variety of other disturbances, including gonadal dysfunction, diabetes mellitus, generalized muscle weakness, hypertension, arthritis, congestive heart failure, and an increased risk of gastrointestinal cancers. The diagnosis of somatotrope adenomas relies on documenting the elevated serum growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor level. And in addition, one of the most sensitive tests for acromegaly is failure to suppress growth hormone production in response to oral load of glucose. Now, the goal of treatment in somatotrope adenoma is to restore the growth hormone level to normal and to decrease the symptoms referable to pituitary mass lesions while not causing hypopituitarism. So the tumor can be removed surgically or destroyed by radiation or the growth hormone secretion can be reduced pharmacologically or by drug therapy. Next would be the corticotrope adenomas. Corticotrope adenomas are usually microadenomas at the time of diagnosis, and these tumors are most often basophilic or densely granulated, and occasionally chromophobic or sparsely granulated. Both variants stain positively with periodic acid shift stain because of the presence of carbohydrate in proopiomelanocortin, which is a precursor of ACTH. The third and common variant is the crook cell adenoma, which is characterized by ring-like deposition of cytokeratin called the crook change. 
this variant has an aggressive natural history compared with the other two subtypes. Normally, ACTH from the pituitary would send a signal and stimulate the adrenal gland to produce cortisol. And if the cortisol level is already increased, then this would send a negative feedback to the pituitary to decrease ACTH production. When the hypercortisolism is due to excessive production of ACTH by the pituitary, it is designated as Cushing disease. So here the pituitary gland tumor over secrete ACTH, which would result to the overstimulation of the adrenal gland. Since the pituitary is diseased, there is no effective negative feedback. So it would continue cortisol production leading to or resulting to hypercortisolism. Cushing syndrome refers to the signs and symptoms, regardless of the cause, associated with excess cortisol in the body. Okay. Sometimes uh, after surgical removal of adrenal gland for treatment of Cushing syndrome, large destructive pituitary adenoma can develop, and this condition is called Nelson syndrome. This condition occurs because of loss of the negative feedback or inhibitory effect of adrenal corticosteroids on a corticotrope microadenoma. So in Nelson syndrome, after removal of the adrenal gland, the existing corticotrope microadenoma would continue secreting ACTH. And since there is no adrenal gland, uh, there will be no negative feedback. So the adenoma would continue producing ACTH and result in the continuing increase in the size of the adenoma until it becomes massively enlarged. So again, since the adrenals are absent, hypercortisolism does not develop, but instead, Nelson syndrome would present with mass effect due to large pituitary tumor. Now, in this slide, we just briefly mentioned some of the other anterior pituitary tumors. Most of the gonadotropes or the LH and FSH producing adenomas are non-functional and usually do not cause recognizable syndrome. Uh, tyrotropes or the TSH producing adenomas and pituitary carcinomas are rare, accounting for less than 1% of pituitary tumors. Plurihormonal adenomas secrete multiple hormones and are usually aggressive. Uh, null cell adenoma do not express any markers of hormonal or lineage differentiation. Uh, pituitary blastoma is an entity that occurs in children, typically younger than two years of age, and morphologically are composed of immature blastema-like cells and so-called uh, the small round blue cells and rosette-like formation. Okay, now we proceed to hypopituitarism. Hypopituitarism refers to decreased uh, secretion of pituitary hormones, which can result from diseases of the hypothalamus or of the pituitary. Hypofunction of the anterior pituitary occurs when approximately 75% of the parenchyma is lost or absent. When accompanied by evidence of posterior pituitary dysfunction, in the form of diabetes insipidus, hypopituitarism is almost always hypothalamic in origin. Most cases of hypopituitarism arise from destructive processes involving the anterior pituitary. Hypopituitarism can be caused by tumors and other mass lesions. Any mass in the cella can cause damage by exerting pressure on adjacent normal pituitary cells. 
Traumatic brain injury and subarachnoid hemorrhage are among the most common causes of pituitary hypofunction. Surgical excision of a pituitary adenoma may inadvertently include normal uh, pituitary tissue. Uh, radiation of the pituitary used to prevent a recurrence of residual tumor after surgery can also damage the non-adenomatous pituitary. As we have mentioned earlier, pituitary apoplexy is caused by sudden hemorrhage into the pituitary gland, often occurring into a pituitary adenoma. Clinically, uh, pituitary apoplexy would cause abrupt onset of excruciating headache, diplopia due to pressure on the oculomotor nerves, and acute hypopituitarism. In severe cases, it can cause cardiovascular collapse, loss of consciousness, and even sudden death. The combination of mass effect from the hemorrhage and acute hypopituitarism makes uh, pituitary apoplexy a neurosurgical emergency. Hypopituitarism can also be caused by ischemic necrosis of the pituitary or Sheehan's syndrome. This is also known as postpartum necrosis and is the most common form of uh, ischemic necrosis of the anterior pituitary. During pregnancy, the anterior pituitary enlarges to almost twice its normal size. Now, this physiologic expansion of the gland is not accompanied by an increase in the blood supply from the low-pressure venous system, so there is relative hypoxia. And when there is uh, any further reduction in the blood supply caused by uh, obstetric hemorrhage or shock, it may pre precipitate infarction of the anterior lobe. Now, the posterior pituitary is supplied directly from an arterial branches, and it is much less susceptible to ischemic injury and therefore is usually not affected. Pituitary necrosis may also be encountered in disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. Uh, can also be seen less commonly in sickle cell anemia, elevated intracranial pressure, traumatic injury, and shock of any origin. Now, Rathke's cleft cyst is lined by ciliated cuboidal epithelium with occasional goblet cells and also by anterior pituitary cells. This cyst can accumulate uh, proteinaceous fluid and expand, compromising the normal gland, causing hypopituitarism. Now, any condition or treatment that destroys part or all of the pituitary gland such as ablation of the pituitary by surgery or radiation, can result in an empty cella and the empty cella syndrome. So empty cella syndrome refers to the presence of an enlarged empty cella torsica that is not filled with pituitary tissue. There are two types of empty cella syndrome. In primary empty cella, a defect in the diaphragm cella allows the arachnoid matter and the cerebrospinal fluid to urinate into the cella, expanding the cella and compressing the pituitary. Classically, this occurs in obese women with a history of multiple pregnancies. Affected individuals often present with visual field defects and occasionally with endocrine anomalies such as hyperprolactinemia due to interruption of inhibitory hypothalamic inputs. In secondary empty cella, a mass such as a pituitary adenoma enlarges the cella 
and is then either surgically removed or undergoes infarction, leading to loss of pituitary function. Now, hypothalamic lesions can also affect the pituitary by causing a deficiency of pituitary hormone releasing factors. In contrast to diseases that involve the pituitary directly, hypothalamic abnormalities can also diminish the secretion of ADH resulting in diabetes insipidus. Hypothalamic lesions that cause hypopituitarism include tumors, which may be benign, like uh, craniopharyngioma, or it may be malignant. Most of the malignant tumors are metastasis from tumors such as the breast and lung carcinoma. Hypothalamic insufficiency may also appear following irradiation of the brain or nasopharyngeal tumors. Now, inflammatory disorders and infections such as sarcoidosis or tuberculosis meningitis can involve the hypothalamus and cause deficiency of anterior pituitary hormones and diabetes insipidus. The clinical manifestation of anterior pituitary hypofunction varies on the specific hormone that are lacking. Now, if there is growth hormone deficiency, this may result to pituitary dwarfism. Uh, gona uh, gonadotropin or LH and FH deficiency lead to amenorrhea and infertility in women and decreased libido impotence and loss of pubic and axillary hair in men. TSH deficiency results in hypothyroidism. ACTH deficiency results in hypoadrenalism. And prolactin deficiency results in failure of postpartum lactation. Next, the posterior pituitary syndromes. The clinically relevant posterior pituitary syndromes involve uh, antidiuretic hormones and include diabetes insipidus and syndromes of inappropriate secretion of ADH. Diabetes insipidus is caused by ADH deficiency. This is a condition characterized by excessive urination due to an inability of the kidney to resorb water properly from the urine. Diabetes insipidus can occur in a variety of conditions including head trauma, tumor, inflammatory disorders of the hypothalamus and pituitary, uh, surgical complications of procedure of the hypothalamus and pituitary, or it may arise spontaneously in the absence of an identifiable underlying disorder. Diabetes insipidus from ADH deficiency is designated as central to differentiate it from nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which is a result of renal tubular unresponsiveness to circulating ADH. The clinical manifestation of the two diabetes insipidus, uh, the central and the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus are the same and include uh, the excretion of large volume of dilute urine with a lower than normal specific gravity. The serum sodium and osmolality are increased due to excessive renal loss of free water resulting in thirst and uh, polydipsia or excessive drinking. Patients who can drink water generally can compensate for the urinary losses, but patients who are abtunded or bedridden or otherwise uh, lim have limited uh, ability to obtain water may develop life-threatening dehydration. Now, in syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, there is excess ADH, okay, which causes overresorption of excessive amount of free water resulting in hyponatremia. 
most frequent causes of SIADH are the secretion of ectopic ADH by malignant neoplasms, particularly small cell carcinoma of the lungs. Drugs that can increase ADH secretion and a variety of central nervous system disorders, including infections and trauma. The clinical manifestations of SIADH are dominated by hyponatremia. Okay? Also, there would be cerebral edema and the resultant neurologic dysfunction. Although the total body water is increased, uh, blood volume remains normal and peripheral edema does not develop in uh, SIADH. Okay, next. Hypothalamic supracellular tumors. Okay, this may induce hypofunction or hyperfunction of the anterior pituitary, diabetes insipidus, or combination of these manifestations. The most common implicated tumors in hypothalamic supracellular tumors uh, are the gliomas and the craniopharyngiomas. Craniopharyngiomas is thought to arise from vestigial remnants of the rachis pouch. They are slow-growing tumors and account for 1 to 5% of intracranial tumors. Most craniopharyngiomas are supracellular with or without an intracellular extension. A small minority occurs within the cella. Age distribution is bimodal uh, with one peak in childhood around 1 to 15 years and the second peak in adults that's about 65 years or older. Patients with uh, craniopharyngioma usually come to attention because of headaches visual disturbances, uh, while children sometimes present with growth retardation due to pituitary hypofunction and growth hormone deficiency. Morphologically, the average size of craniopharyngiomas is uh, 3 to 4 cm in diameter. They may be encapsulated and solid, but more commonly they are cystic and sometimes multiloculated. They often encroach on the optic chiasm or the cranial nerves and they may also bulge into the floor of the third ventricle and the base of the brain. Craniopharyngiomas have two distinct variants. The adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma, which is often observed in children and frequently contains radiographically demonstrable calcification, and uh, the second variant is the papillary craniopharyngioma, which is most often observed in adults and are rarely calcified. The next slides will show the characteristic of the two variants, and I would just emphasize on their difference. Both Adam adamantinomatous and papillary craniopharyngiomas have stratified squamous epithelium, but the adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma is embedded in a spongy reticulum and exhibits palisading at the periphery of the tumor. While the papillary craniopharyngioma have papillary formation and do not have a spongy reticulum and also do not have peripheral palisading. The diagnostic Features of uh, adamantinomatous craniopharyngiomas are the lamellar keratin formation or the wet keratin, uh, dystrophic calcification, and cyst formation, which are all not seen in papillary craniopharyngiomas. So here we have pictures of the two variants of craniopharyngioma. The adamantinomatous exhibit keratin formation and uh, peripheral nuclear palisading, while the papillary craniopharyngioma show papillary formation and there are no palisading. Okay, craniopharyngiomas with less than 5 cm diameter have an excellent recurrence free or overall survival. While tumors greater than 5 cm in diameter 
although are more invasive, the size does not have much impact on the prognosis. Malignant transformation of craniopharyngiomas into uh, squamous cell carcinoma is rare and usually would occur only after irradiation. Okay, that was the last slide for the first part of the two sessions on the chapter on the endocrine system. I hope uh, you learned something from the presentation, but I would like to remind you not to rely on this presentation. You still have to read the chapter on your textbook. We will continue on the second part on our next session. So thank you, stay safe, and study well.